Hi everyone. So in today's lecture, we are going to be looking at hazardous waste and site remediation. So I want to start by defining hazardous waste. So hazardous waste is any discarded material, liquid or solid, that contains substances known to be fatal to humans or laboratory animals in low doses, toxic, carcinogenic, mutagenic, or teratogenic, which means it causes birth defects, to humans or other life forms, ignitable with a flash point less than 60 degrees Celsius, corrosive, or explosive, explosive or highly reactive, which means that it undergoes violent chemical reactions either by itself or in mixed with other materials. So if we are talking about the main producers of hazardous waste, we can see that by and large, the chemical and petroleum industries produce most of the hazardous waste in the United States, followed by metal processing and mining and then other industries rounded out. But really, about 71% of our hazardous waste is produced by chemical and petroleum industries. Used, right, petroleum industries, we've talked about fossil fuels, oil, and the various products that are made from gasoline to fuel oil, et cetera, plastics. Uh, and chemicals uh, we'll touch on, right? Chemicals are used in all these things from cosmetics to cleaning products, et cetera. So how do we regulate and manage our hazardous waste to ensure that it is disposed of properly and it is not leaking out into our environment or causing health effects or environmental effects? Well, in 1976, Congress passed RICRA, or the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and this is the federal uh, regulation or federal law that regulates hazardous waste management and disposal from cradle to the grave, right? So from its generation at whatever plant it is being produced at, from its transportation all the way to its disposal at a secure landfill or secure site. And there are um, regulations and rules and requirements through this process and reporting requirements to ensure that this waste is um, managed, transported, and disposed of properly, and is not polluted into our environment. But what about before RICRA, right? What about before 1976? Well, it's estimated that 5 billion tons of highly poisonous chemicals were improperly disposed of between 1950 and 1975, before regulations became more stringent, right? Where now we have these regulations on how we deal with uh, hazardous materials and hazardous waste. Before those regulations, um, we <laughs> were a little more lax with what we did with these poisonous chemicals. And we refer to these as orphan waste, or it might be uh, heard of as legacy pollution. You might hear that term as well. And we're going to take a look at probably what is maybe the most famous example of that. So Love Canal is a neighborhood in Niagara Falls, New York. And during the 1940s, the Hooker Chemical Company dumped almost, well, 43,700 pounds of chemical byproducts from the manufacturing of dyes, perfumes, and solvents for rubber and synthetic resins in the canal. Now, the canal was drained and lined with clay, and they loaded it up with 55-gallon drums that were filled with these chemicals and buried them at a depth of about 20 to 25 feet. And the kind of crazy but important thing to note was that this was legal, right? They purchased the canal and this property specifically for or to be used as a chemical dumping ground. And they were given permission by the Niagara Power and Development Company. And what happened is they dumped these chemicals for uh, a number of years. And then in the early 1950s, they sold the site to the local school board. And two schools were built on the site. And what they did is they they capped over that area where they've been dumping with more clay and they sold it uh, the site to the school board and they wanted no liability as part of that uh, sale. And then later, the site was further redeveloped for residential housing. Right. And by the 1970s, there was an established suburban community over or, or around Love Canal. Now. Obviously, as you might expect with this chemical dumping ground, right, for years, residents complained of foul odors and chemicals on their properties and black fluid flowing out of that canal. And sampling was done by reporters in 1976 of sump pumps, and they found toxic chemicals. 
And later in 1977, the city began an environmental investigation after uh, organic compounds were found in the basements of 11 homes. And by 1978, Love Canal had become a national media event with articles referring to the neighborhood as a public health time bomb and one of the most appalling environmental tragedies in American history. And there were numerous health effects related to this amongst people. They had higher white blood cell counts, which is a precursor to leukemia. Low birth weights were observed in this community. Birth defects and chromosome damage above that of uh, a control or what would be the normal would seen in a normal population. So really what this spawned in this national outrage, just like if we're talking about the Cuyahoga River, right, when we learned about uh, last week and how that spawned the Clean Water Act, that national outrage, well, Love Canal, the, uh, if there is a benefit to it, is that it spawned legislation, and that is uh, CERCLA, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, but it's also referred to as Superfund or the Superfund Act. Now, this was passed in 1980. It was modified in 1984, and it was designed to investigate and clean up sites contaminated with hazardous substances, such as Love Canal. And in fact, Love Canal became the first Superfund site. So besides just investigating and cleaning up sites, Superfund also established a toxic release inventory, right? So manufacturing facilities are required to report annually on the use, release, or transfer of toxic substances. And you can find that information. It's, it is available to the public. You can see the link right there. And if you go to that, you can type in uh, your state or, or zip code, and it will show you um, this inventory or these manufacturing facilities around your area that uh, are dealing with toxic substances. Now, historically, 70% of Superfund cleanup activities have been paid for by the potentially responsible parties. Right. So if there is a, a site that has been polluted, the EPA, which um, manages or regulates Superfund, right, will um, designate or track down the responsible party. And it is then the um, responsibility of that party to um, do the cleanup, right, or at least pay for the cleanup of the site. But sometimes the party cannot be found or is unable to pay uh, about 30 percent of the time historically. And with that, uh, a fund and super fund is used uh, to pay for the cleanup. Now, that funding originally came from a tax that we had placed on chemical companies that produce toxic and hazardous wastes. Right. They these are companies that are producing these materials. We tax them, and that money from that tax is then used to clean up sites that get damaged. However, in 1995, that tax was not renewed, and there was lobbying by a lot of these companies to say, well, we were not the ones that were specifically responsible for this cleanup, so why should we have to pay for it? And what happened is, um, instead of the, the funding, the, the, the money for that super fund, um, instead of coming from that tax by these chemical companies, most of it then came from being funded by taxpayers, right? So you and I were paying our taxes and that tax money was going to clean up these sites. However, in November 2021, Congress reauthorized that excise tax on chemical manufacturers. Uh, so they are once again paying into this fund. Now, it is estimated by the EPA that there are at least 36,000 seriously contaminated sites in the United States. So how does this Superfund process work? Well, it starts out by the EPA being notified by citizens or environmental consultants or state agencies of a contaminated site or a possible release of hazardous substances at a site. They then will conduct a preliminary assessment in which they gather historical data on the site and do a site inspection where, or a site assessment where they will test soil, water, and the air to determine what hazardous substances are present and whether they are being released to the environment or, and are a threat to human health. And they established a hazard ranking system that gives a score from 0 to 100 uh, to a site based on the potential of the site to pose a threat to human health or the environment. And if that site scores 28.5 or above, it gets listed on the national priorities list. And that national priorities list, that means it is a Superfund site and it can go 
they will go forward with this remedial investigation and these remedial actions that I'm going to talk about. So they will do this assessment. They have this hazard ranking sh system. If it if they score high enough, they become uh, listed on the national priorities list. And then the further things that we'll talk about uh, come into play. There are currently 1,333 sites that are listed on the national priorities list. So the next step is then a remedial investigation. And the goal of the remedial investigation is to determine the nature and extent of the contamination, right? So what exactly is are the contaminants? Where are they located at the site and their extent of them? Have they traveled? And then as part of this, uh, they assess the methods of treatment, right? So we've identified what our pollutants are, where they are, how are we going to treat them? And there is a community outreach involved as part of this, because often these are very, very hazardous sites uh, and they can have uh, large impacts or, or uh, um, significant impacts on both the environment and human health. So there is a community outreach where they get the public involved and they um, talk to the public about what they're doing uh, or the local community. After that remedial investigation, there is a record of decision. So they determine what um, cleanup methods will be used. Then there's the remedial design and the remedial action where they actually prepare to and then conduct the cleanup at the site using these various methods. Once all physical cleanup at the site is completed, they, uh, the next milestone is this construction is completed. And then there's post-construction completion where during this process, they're operating and maintaining any long-term cleanup technologies and they're regularly reviewing and monitoring the site. And ultimately, after all of this, when their cleanup goals have been met, that site gets delisted from the national priorities list. And there are 448 deleted sites now, right? So like I said, Superfund or um, Love Canal was the first Superfund site. And it was the first site on that national priorities list. And in 2004, after extensive cleanup, it was deleted from that list, right? So it has met its cleanup goals and presumably now that site is safe for uh, redevelopment or whatever is going to be done at that site. So besides just these super fun sites and these very, very hazardous sites, there are also other sites that are contaminated, right, or, or need site remediation, but maybe aren't as bad to be um, listed on the uh, national priorities list. And some possibly are, but um, there are also brownfield sites, which is something that you guys should be aware of. Now, these are abandoned industrial sites contaminated with hazardous pollutants. And as a result, they are unsafe to be, it is unsafe to rebuild on these sites without extensive cleanup. And often they remain unused in communities and they're eyesore, they're a blight on the community, nothing's being done there. And it's estimated that there are more than 450,000 brownfields in the US. So these abandoned industrial areas that need to be remediated, but without being remediated, they are just gonna persist as these, what they are there in that picture that you see there. Now, fortunately, there is an EPA grant program that, um, provides money to clean up and redevelop these brownfields. So you can take something that abandoned uh, uh, land or that abandoned industrial area and transform it into something that could be used by the community, whether it is a park, passive recreation area, or some other type of development. So we have our very, very um, hazardous sites that get listed as Superfund sites. We have brownfields, some of which could be Superfunds, but not all of them. And then we have other sites, right, that may not fall under either of those categories, but still could be um, contributing hazardous waste to the ground, groundwater, soil, or the air, or could have leaks that are, are uh, resulting in those pollutants as well. And those are active um, petroleum sites in the left there, or active chemical sites in the upper right, gas stations. Uh, even dry cleaners are all uh, sites that potentially could be um, leaking uh, hazardous waste into the soil and groundwater. So how do we actually remediate these sites? Right, as we talked in the 
Um, as part of that Superfund process, there's a remedial investigation. But this remedial investigation and this site remediation um, goes for not just those Superfund sites, right? This is the same general process that you would find in brownfield sites. It's the same general process that you will find at a gas station that has had a, a leaky UST, that underground storage tank, and right, some of that uh, gasoline product is now in your groundwater. Uh, could be at a dry cleaner that had been a release of chemicals or one of those chemical or petroleum factories or, or um, refineries that we looked at. So the process is generally the same. So if you are at an area or a site where there is a suspected leak or suspected pollutant or hazardous waste contamination, the first thing that you need to do is this remedial investigation. And that is to identify what pollutants are in your uh, groundwater or your soil, right, or what pollutants have been released, and the extent of their contamination, right? If you see that plume down over here on the left, right, you could have had a leak that is, uh, that leak is coming from maybe this underground storage tank right here, but it's going to spread as it leaks out, right? If it gets in the groundwater, it's going to flow in the groundwater. It'll spread as it more of that leaking occurs even in your soil, so you'll see high concentrations right by the leak, and then the concentrations will get lower as it spreads. But you can see there could be extensive spread throughout a community, et cetera. So you need to identify what pollutants they are and how far they have spread in an area. And you refer to this as uh, delineating, right? You want to delineate the extent of your contamination. So to do that, you will do different methods. Uh, you may take soil borings uh, that you will see. This is occurring right here, right? So you'll hire a drilling company. They'll take a number of borings around your site. Uh, so that, that's a, a smaller um, drill working on there. And they're taking some borings right there. And what they will you will get from those borings are these sleeves of soil. You could take little samples of those, send them off to the lab, and you will get uh, results of whatever you're analyzing for. So contaminant results at different layers. And through that, you could start to identify or delineate the extent of your soil contamination. You may also want to look at groundwater, right? So you will drill groundwater wells. And they're typically what you might see here, right? It's essentially an outer casing in a PVC pipe. And that PVC pipe has slits in it to allow water to flow into it or groundwater to flow into it. That is, uh, that's what you're seeing right there that's if you go to a gas station you'll see these monitoring wells and, and many gas stations right so here's your well that's your pvc pipe it is set down a certain number of feet into your whatever the groundwater level is and you will go out there or a, a, an environmental scientist will go out there they'll use a pump similar to this and they will pump that water out to get a sample and you would install these wells again around your site to try and delineate the extent of your contamination. They'll also be used to monitor how effective your remedial actions are being, right? Are your later on as you're either doing treatment or you're doing, uh, you're just um, what is referred to as monitored natural attenuation. So you're just monitoring the natural breakdown of this contaminant. You will continually take samples uh, to make sure that is occurring or you're seeing a decrease. You may also want to investigate air, right? Ambient air around, right? There's the potential for, uh, depending on the uh, pollutant and where it's located, uh, for your ambient air to be affected, but also the soil vapors, right? So uh, are your soil, uh, the contaminants, is there a lot of uh, vapor in your soil? These are volatile organic compounds, many of these, and volatile just means that it has the ability to uh, essentially vaporize. So go from what it is and vaporize into the air and become an air contaminant. So I mean, you may install these vapor pins like this uh, and these get installed in your soil. These are actually quite small, right? That's actual uh, pin right in there. So you use a big drill, a hand drill. You drill into, depending on where you are, you drill into maybe your slab of concrete here. You install that vapor pin and then you would use a SUMA canister uh, and a regulator to um, sample the uh, soil vapors, right? Right there, and that would be shipped off to the lab and you'd get your results. So that's the first step in this remedial uh, investigation. You wanna I, you use these various methods
to identify your pollutants and then uh, delineate their extent. And now you may also do other things as well. Depending on where your site is located, you will do ecological surveys because there could be potential impact to sensitive areas such as streams or rivers or wetlands. So you may do an ecological survey. Um, if you are in a more rural area or an older area where there is well water, you will likely do a well canvas. So you will go around, you will look at historical records, you will find where are groundwater wells in the area, and you will survey those to see if they're still existent. Uh, and you may sample those, right? Because you want to make sure we're trying to protect human health. You want to make sure that your contaminant hasn't spread to these wells. So that's all part of this remedial investigation. And there's more to it, but this is the general overview. Now, the next step is to conduct a remedial action, right? So you've identified your pollutants, you know their general extent, ideally, and now you're going to do something to treat them. So we're going to watch these two quick videos that are going to look at some different methods or some different remedial actions that you can do to treat groundwater as well as soil. So we'll start with groundwater. <laughs>
So those were a couple of um, groundwater remediation methods uh, that you saw there. All of them are commonly done in the time that I spent as an environmental scientist working for a consulting company. Uh, I saw all of that happen, right? I, I took part in um, some of those. Generally, for most of your um, sites that have lower levels of pollutants, uh, that uh, you see a lot of that monitored natural attenuation. So you just delineate your area and you uh, monitor as it naturally breaks down. But for some of your more hazardous pollutants uh, or where there are higher levels, uh, typically you will take some sort of remedial action or more active remedial action, whether through pump and treat, or um, the air sparging or injection of chemicals. And then let's take a look at some soil remediation methods.
Okay, so a couple more um, remedial actions uh, that people can take to address soil contamination, right? So just wanted to show and highlight a couple of these different remediation methods uh, for you guys to be aware of. If you've ever um, work in a consultant field or want to get into the environmental science field, oftentimes you will work for environmental consultants and you may be doing some of these actions and you may see this happen uh, in person. Oh, how do I go forward? Every PowerPoint, I messed that up. No, stop playing. Okay. <laughs> so um, one of the last things I want to touch on is site remediation in New Jersey. So um, the Site Remediation Reform Act was signed May 7th, 2009, and it fundamentally changed the way site remediation is conducted in New Jersey. So I was getting into consulting um, right around the time when this was happening, and there was this transition. And it was a couple of years, that act was signed in 2009, and there was a couple of years where this transition occurred. And what happened is that this act created the Licensed Site Remediation Professional Position, or the LSRP position. And it's the LSRP now that oversees the remediation of contaminated sites. And why this was important is because previously or prior to this LSRP uh, position, how this would work is that the consultant company or the um, the um, company doing the remediation work, um, they would have to get New Jersey DEP approval for all of their actions, right? And it would be regular approval. So there was, um, you would do an investigation, you would write this remedial investigation plan, um, you'd have to send it to the DEP for approval before you could do actions. You would start doing actions, you would need to get approval by the DEP before you can go forward or you can modify things. There were regular reports, quarterly reports that you would be submitting to the DEP that needed to be approved. So there was a lot of um, materials or reports that you had to send to DEP, and there was often a backlog, right? Because there's they had limited personnel, and there's a lot of sites that need to be cleaned up. And if you have to keep going to them for approval, um, like I said, there would be a backlog, and things would move slowly. So the idea behind this LSRP program is that you license – site remediational site remediation professionals and now those lsrps are responsible for the remediation of contaminated sites and they don't need dep direction or approval right so the lsrp can take these remediation or these remedial actions they can come up with this plan they can go forward with that plan without needing this approval for each step along the way from the dep and this was supposed to uh, really speed things up in terms of remediating sites. Now, the DEP still plays a role, right? They monitor this remediation uh, progress and LSRP actions through documents that need to be submitted and, uh, and forms, but it's not nearly the amount or, or the extent that needed to be before this program, right? And now there are requirements of the LSRP. There's this initial licensing requirement. You have to take a test, all this stuff. Uh, if you are an LSRP, you have to do continuing educations to make sure you're up to date on the most recent um, uh, uh, rules, as well as techniques that are being utilized. And you need to have this relicensing every three years. Now, uh, again, I, this was going on and this was getting kickstarted right as I was getting out of, as, as when it became more fully realized, I was getting out of working for environmental consultants. Uh, but it did seem that there was a, a more streamlined process with this LSRP program, right? It was a lot, it, it took a lot of the reporting and this excess and this wait time for approval away and we we're able to move faster in getting things done. Uh, and really how you would measure the success of this is the amount of cases that you close, right? So just like with when we were talking about Superfund sites, like ultimately those sites get deleted from that national priorities list in New Jersey and I'm sure in other states, ultimately cases become closed, right? So there is contamination, there's a spill, something happens and you open a case with the, with the DEP, right? And then now that case number is assigned to that site. 
uh, and you will do all these remedial actions. And ultimately, you would clean up your site, right? That's the ultimate goal. And then you would receive a case closure or no further action, basically saying that the, the site has been cleaned up, you don't need to do anything else, and now the case is closed. And you can see from 2009, when this was start, when this was implemented, to 2021, nearly 60,000 cases were closed in New Jersey. So that's a really good sign um, that work is being done, and it seems to be being done in a, in a more streamlined way. So again, this is just to provide an overview of site remediation. We can go more in depth in how it works in New Jersey and some of the more regulations, but uh, in general, this is the uh, process and how it works. The last thing that I want to mention is because I always kind of show like what you could do personally to reduce um, hazardous waste or potential hazardous waste or spills. Um, a lot, as we saw in the beginning, a lot of our wastes come from chemical manufacturing and petroleum manufacturing and refinery. Uh, so if you could reduce your use of some of these household chemicals, right, if we're reducing our dependency on some of these household chemicals, we could reduce their or the need or the amount that gets produced and uh, the amount of hazardous waste that ultimately needs to be disposed of or that could potentially leak out as a pollutant. So you can use non-toxic alternatives for many household chemicals, right? A, a floor cleaner, and, and they are listed up there. I'll just touch on a couple of them, right? If you want to mop your floors, you can use vinegar mixed with water. Uh, furniture polish, you can use olive, almond, or lemon oil. Uh, if you need to clean your drains, don't use Drano. It never really works that great. Anyway, get a plumber's snake. It's a little more gross, right? It's uh, it, uh, you stick it down your drain, pull it out. You're going to pull out a bunch of gross stuff, mostly hair, uh, and you dispose of it. And it's a lot better than utilizing Drano. It's more effective, too. Um Window cleaner, again, different things you can utilize. Toilet cleaner, vinegar, great stuff. Uh, and pest control, we kind of touched on this a little bit when we were looking at like pest, integrated pest management and et cetera. There are more uh, natural or organic things that could you could utilize to help uh, repel some pests and they are listed as below, right? Besides just soap and water, um, utilize other plants that are pest repellents, right? And and go for those biological controls. Everybody loves ladybugs in their gardens because they eat uh, aphids and, and other insects. So that is it. Um, that is it for this lecture. And I hope you guys are doing great.